Okay, so welcome to the next in our series of screencast videos. Uh, in this video, we'll pick up where we left off in the previous one, where we've introduced a vector. So in the last in the last video, we introduced the notion of a vector in two or three dimensions. Uh, well, we talked a little bit about how to generalize that to n dimensions. Uh, we gave the definitions for addition and scalar multiplication. We saw if you write down a vector in terms of its components. So if I write a vector, say v equals say a b c so those numbers a b c are the components of a vector and what they sort of represent so remember that vectors are meant to encode both a magnitude and a direction and what those numbers are telling us is basically how to get from the tail of the vector to the tip so they say well if you add a to the x coordinate you add b to the y coordinate you add c to the z coordinate um, you will travel from the tail of the vector to the tip of the vector um, and so you get this geometric interpretation of the vector so we saw last time that the way you add vectors is you add the corresponding components so you would add the x co um, components add the y components add the z components much like when you add complex numbers you add the corresponding real and imaginary parts um, we saw how to define scalar multiplication where you you multiply each entry in the vector by some common scalar and we saw that there there's a geometric multiple uh, interpretation of that as well which is you know it's called a scalar because it scales the vector if i if i multiply a vector by uh, say 2 like 2 times v would be the vector 2a 2b 2c and that would give me a vector which uh, is twice as long but points in the same direction um, so we're gonna we're gonna look uh, a little bit more at some of the properties that those two operations, addition and scalar multiplication, the properties that those have. But uh, before we get to that, we're going to um, pause briefly to talk about uh, unit vectors, parallel vectors, and unit vectors. So first, the definition of parallel. So um, thinking of scalar multiplication we have this idea that if you multiply a vector by a scalar you're changing the magnitude but not the direction so if one vector is a scalar multiple of another uh, we can say that those two vectors are parallel that they lie along the same line so um, if if we have one vector a and we have another vector b if we can find this scalar k so that i can write um, a as k times b so a is a scalar multiple of b uh, this is a way of, of communicating the fact that our vectors are parallel. Um, so for example, um, let's just do two-dimensional examples because that will fit nicely on the screen. Um, let's say that u looks like, uh, maybe use the vector 1, 2. Um, so if v, let's say the vector v is maybe 2, 4. Um, so using the rules for scalar multiplication, I can pull out a 2. I can write that as 2 times 1, 2. So that's uh, 2 times u. Or maybe I have uh, w. w is equal to maybe uh, minus 3 minus 6, let's say, which is minus 3 times 1, 2. So uh, minus 3 times u. Um, so I can I can consider all, so all of those vectors would be considered to be parallel. So v and w are both parallel to u because they're written as scalar multiples of u. Um, and and of course I can I could turn things around. I could say that the vector u uh, u in turn I could write as well uh, one half of of v, or I could write it as minus one third of w. So so parallelism is is a two way street. If if a is parallel to b then then b should be parallel to a. The only maybe exception to that rule is if you extend the definition of parallel to allow for the the zero vector, right? If I took a to be the zero vector um, and then I took k equal to zero, right? Then zero is equal to zero times any other vector. Um, so there are weird things like that that can go on, but of course if you're thinking about parallel, you, you're thinking about direction, and the zero vector doesn't have a direction, so normally uh, parallel is a term that you would consider in the context of non-zero vectors. Um, just to kind of give you an illustration of, of where things are here, let's draw the, uh, so you being one unit uh, to the right and two units up, the vector u, if I draw it as a position vector with its tail at the origin, um, and there's my vector u. Uh, the vector v uh, is, uh, I'm multiplying by two, so I get something in the same direction but twice as long. So there, there's two u, so that would be my my v. 
twice as long as you. Um, w, uh, I'm multiplying here by a, by a negative scalar. Oops, I'm missing an equal sign there. Um, when you multiply by a negative scalar, you reverse the direction. So, so W would be a vector which is three times as long and pointing in the opposite direction. So I would get something um, pointing down here. Um, okay. Now, um, often when you're when you're talking about parallel vectors, you're concerned with the direction. One of the one of the constructions you often use is that of a unit vector. Um, so a unit vector, you know, is is basically we standardize the situation to insist that we're just going to talk about vectors that have length one, right? So if 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 all of our vectors have magnitude one, then magnitude is really no longer something that we think about. We only have to think about the direction, right? So a unit vector has length one, and and what's relevant about a unit vector is the direction in which it's pointing. And so, if if somebody hands you a vector and you care about you care about the direction that vector is in, you may want to construct the unit vector which is in the same direction as um, as the vector you started with. Um, just to give you a quick example of a unit vector, and then we'll we'll show you how you would actually construct such a thing. Um, if I gave you, let's say, u to be uh, 3 over 5, uh, 4 over 5, uh, you can check that that is a unit vector. I'll leave that as an exercise for you uh, to verify that that is a unit vector. Uh, remember, uh, just if you look up the, the definition of, uh, of magnitude, which was done in the previous video, Make sure I spell exercise right. Um, so in the previous video, remember the definition of magnitude is, is, you know, along the same lines as the definition of modulus for a complex number. We should square these two components. We square 3 over 5. We square 4 over 5. If you add those two together, you'll find that you get 25 over 25. Um, when you take the square root, you get a magnitude of 1. All right. Now, let's suppose that somebody gives you some other vector v. And and you want to come up with a unit vector u. You would like u to be a unit vector which is parallel to v. So you want u to be equal to k times v. So u is parallel to v. Um, and you would like the magnitude of u to be equal to 1. Um, and, and, you know, while we're at it, we might as well say that, you know, it's not enough to just be parallel. Uh, let's say we want them in the same direction. So we want to... Uh, uh, so we want u to be the magnitude of u to be equal to one, and we would like k to be positive. We want k to be a positive scalar, so that u and v point in the same direction. Um, the only thing that's different is the magnitudes. So what value should we choose for k if we want the magnitude of u to be equal to one? Well, remember that when you compute the magnitude of a scalar multiple, if I have a scalar inside the, the magnitude, one of the properties of magnitude with respect to scalar multiplication is that you can take this scalar and you can bring it out front. And if it's a positive scalar, you can bring it out directly. With negative scalars, you have to worry about sign changes, but with positive scalars, that k comes straight out. So we would get k times the magnitude of v and we want that to be equal to 1, right? We want the magnitude of u to be equal to 1. And that suggests that this scalar k should be equal to 1 over the magnitude of, of v. And so this is how we construct our unit vector. So our unit vector u is, is 1 over the magnitude of v which is a scalar, right? Remember, the magnitude is just a number, so 1 over a number is still a number. So we take this scalar and we multiply by the vector v, and that gives us our unit vector. Okay. Now, um, among all the unit vectors that you could consider, there are certain basic ones which come up all the time. They're important enough that they're given sort of their own special names. Um, we'll look at what these guys look like in both two and three dimensions. So in two dimensions, Let's draw a two-dimensional coordinate system. So there are sort of two fundamental directions in the Cartesian coordinate plane, right? The x direction and the y direction. These are sort of the most important directions. And, and in particular, the positive x and positive y directions uh, are, are the ones that we're interested in. So there, there are sort of two standard vectors that you could draw. 
you could draw this vector parallel to the x-axis. You could draw this vector parallel to the y-axis. And so these guys have names. We call these usually i and j. And of course, if we want these to, we want these to be unit vectors, we want them to have length 1, well then we should go out one unit in the x direction would take me to the point 1, 0. If I go up one unit in the y direction, that would take me to the point um, 0, 1. And I've drawn both of these vectors with their tails at the origin, and so that tells me that I should be writing i as the vector 1, 0. I should be writing j as the vector 0, 1. Now, what's really useful about these vectors, aside from kind of keeping track of these kind of x and y directions, these fundamental directions that we deal with all the time, um, what's really useful is if you kind of play around with the properties of vector addition and scalar multiplication. Let's say you take any other vector in R2. So I take a vector AB. Um, well, one of the things I could do is I can take this vector and I could split it into two pieces. Uh, one piece which is entirely in the x direction and one piece which is entirely in the y direction. So if I had, uh, let's kind of draw things in, if, if this was my vector a, b, right, then this is the usual story that I, I kind of drop a perpendicular down and I would get this vector here, that would be my vector a0, and then this guy coming up, that would be the vector uh, 0b. So I can split those guys up, but then the other thing I can do is I can, I can take out these scalars. I could bring the a out front, a times 1, 0, and b times 0, 1. Um, right, because a times 1 would give me a, a times 0 gives me 0, so if I work back in the other direction, it's clear that uh, these guys are equal. And so then what I get is that any vector in this, of the form a comma b, can also be written as a i plus b j. So you can write any vector in terms of these i and j unit vectors. Um, you'll find frequently um, in engineering and physics that in many cases, this is the preferred notation, uh, this ij notation, rather than writing things down um, in terms of these angle bracket notation. Uh, now, in three dimensions, you can play the same game. Uh, of course, this time we have three vectors. So you have a vector i pointing along the x-axis. You have a vector j pointing along the y-axis and well next letter in the alphabet is k so we draw a vector k pointing up along the z-axis and and you can guess that just as just as in two dimensions if you want these guys to be unit vectors you want them to have length one then you don't have much choice if you want something that's length one and it points along the x-axis it's got to be of the form 1, 0, 0. J is going to have to be of the form 0, 1, 0. K is going to have to be of the form 0, 0, 1. Right? So it's clear that these vectors all have length 1 and that they point in the directions you want. Uh, and just as in two dimensions, and I'm not going to go through all the steps, but you can check that it's likewise true in R3, that if I had a, a general three-dimensional vector A, B, C, I can write that as a i plus b j plus c k. Okay. Um, so expressions like this guy on the on the left, by the way, these these sorts of expressions, these are these are sometimes known as uh, linear combinations. That's something we'll be talking about again later in the course. Uh, so the linear combination is sort of the fundamental object in linear algebra. It, it's sort of, you know, something that you can build out of other vectors using the two operations of addition and scalar multiplication. And one of the things that you're often concerned about in linear algebra is whether or not a given vector can be written as a linear combination of some other vectors. And if you're in a situation where you have a set of vectors 
such that you can always do this uniquely. You're always guaranteed that you can find you know these numbers a, b, and c, um, so that you can write the left hand side in terms of the right hand side. Um, a collection of vectors like this is called a a basis, and this is a very sort of important idea in linear algebra, and it's one that we will touch on briefly in this course. Um, all right, before we jump ahead, uh, the only other thing to mention, uh, you do take a bit of care about context because you'll notice that we use i and j in both two and three dimensions. The, the vector i in R2 is not the same thing as the vector i in R3. You can see they're different objects, right? One of them has two components, the other one has three components. Um, you know, but usually uh, in the context you'll be able to tell between the two because you'll know what dimension you're working in and so there's usually not too much risk of confusion. Okay, um, here are eight properties that you can you can verify for yourself. We're not going to do them here. Um, we don't we don't I, I don't want to make this video drag on. It will it would be far too long if we tried to go through some of these properties. But if you if you take the addition in the scalar multiplication that we've defined for vectors in R n, uh, right? This could be two R two. This could be R three. It could be R four. Doesn't matter. Um, these eight properties are satisfied um, by by vectors in R n for any n. Okay, so the order so one tells me that the order of addition doesn't matter. Two tells me that uh, if I need to add three or more vectors, I can group them however I want. Uh, placement of brackets doesn't matter. Um, there is a zero element, right? The zero vector with all components equal to zero. If I add that to any other vector, nothing happens. Uh, there is an additive inverse, right? If I change the sign of each one of the components, adding that to the original vector, those two are going to combine to give me zero, uh, right? So, so those four properties, of course, those are properties um, that um, we already saw were true for addition with real numbers, for addition with complex numbers. And, and the reason that they're they're true here is that addition of vectors is defined in terms of addition of real numbers, right? Because you just add the corresponding components. And so the reason why, you know, x plus y is equal to y plus x here is because that's true for real numbers. Um, the final four properties, five, six, seven, eight, have to do with scalar multiplication. Um, Five is just the observation that multiplying by the scalar one does nothing. Six says that you know the the multiplication, the scalar multiplication is compatible with the usual real number multiplication. Um, if you if you did a sequence of scalar multiplications, that's the same thing as you know. So if I did multiply by d and then I multiply by c, that's the same thing as if I first multiplied the scalars together and then did one scalar multiplication. Um, Seven and eight, these two together, these guys are, are both distributive properties. And you'll notice that there are two of them. And the reason there are two of them is because you've got two different types of addition. Um, the first distributive property has to do with addition. You know, on the left-hand side, that addition is in, um, in Rn. It's an addition of vectors. Um, and then uh, the... In property eight, that addition on the left, that's addition um, in the real numbers, or you're adding two numbers together and then doing the scalar multiplication. Um, so there's two different distributive properties because there's there's two different types of addition that might come up. Um, and, and as usual, um, these are these properties are going to drive a lot of uh, equation solving. If you're trying to do vector equations, these sorts of things might come up. Um, so you'll encounter these properties. Um, as we kind of go through some examples where we try to to solve equations involving vectors, um, and, uh, and and of course just even in simplifying expressions, things like you know, so property eight would tell you, for example, that you know if I was doing two x plus three x, that well two plus three is five, so you know we're, I kind of have the left hand side here, c is equal to two, d is equal to three, I can add those together and get five x, and I know that this sort of of operation is justified. All right, um, so that's uh, that's all we'll do uh, in this video for vector algebra. We'll be doing some examples in class with numbers. We'll show you how all of these operations work and how they all fit together. Um, we'll do plenty of computational examples uh, in the classroom.